There are no other Everglades in the world. They are, they have always been, one of the unique regions of the earth, remote, never wholly known. Nothing anywhere else is like them. The miracle of light pours over the green and brown expanse of sawgrass and of water shining and slow moving below. The grass and water that is the meaning and the central fact of the Everglades of Florida. It is a river of grass. The Everglades is a mystery. Uh, so many people, I think, have misunderstood what the Everglades is. And they thought of it many years ago as just a nasty old swamp, uh, when in fact it is just an incredible wetland that is our life support. It not only provides a habitat for all of the creatures that we have uh, in the southern part of our peninsula and for a lot of migratory birds that are here uh, periodically, but it is the water supply for human consumption. It's the great reservoir. Without the Everglades, most of us wouldn't be living here in South Florida because we wouldn't have a source of clean drinking water. So you'd think that settlers would have treated the river of grass with great respect, but they didn't. In the 1950s, Florida underwent a growth spurt that made the state nearly unrecognizable. Well, the state was changing so rapidly that it was hard to believe. As Bob Graham, Governor Graham, has often said, the combination of Social Security, air conditioning, and low-cost air travel completely changed Florida forever. And, of course, the drainage of the Everglades system opened millions of acres of land for farming and uh, housing. Yes, instead of nurturing the Everglades, developers got the okay to drain many thousand acres of the swamp. That created dry land to build homes for the influx of people moving here, and for the farmers and cattlemen who needed vast acres of land for their crops and livestock. That was just one of many assaults on the Everglades by people who didn't understand the consequences of their actions. The Army Corps of Engineers was the agency at the heart of many of the projects, including the massive rerouting of the Kissimmee River, which is north of Lake Okeechobee. The owners of land on the upstream lakes in the K Kissimmee chain of lakes persuaded their congressional representatives who found a more than willing Corps of Engineers to maintain the water levels in those lakes at certain levels so they could launch their boats and never have to worry that too much water would go up on their lawns if they built their houses close to the lakes. How did they manage to do it? Engineers would first have to create a system of dikes and canals to rechannel the sprawling Kissimmee River. Here you had the wandering winding, meandering Kissimmee River. Why not dredge a straight line right through it and dump that water into Lake Okeechobee? It seemed like a good plan at the time, but no one took into account what would happen downstream during heavy rains. Rather than spreading the rainwater through a wide area around the winding Kissimmee River, the water rushed down its straight new path directly into Lake Okeechobee. All that water threatened to spill over the dike, which was built in 1928. It spilled out of sand. It leaks. If you get too much water in Lake Okeechobee, the dike could fail. It almost failed five years ago. It came within a, an inch of failing. It would have killed thousands of people between Canal Point and Clewiston. But straightening the Kissimmee River also had a devastating effect on the birds and animals living there. It wiped out the plant life and changed the water levels necessary for their survival. So we're living in uh, an environmental disaster that was not fully understood or comprehended at the time. And that disaster extended to the vast area south of Lake Okeechobee as flood control became a priority with more and more people moving into South Florida. Well, there was a lot of dikes put in, a lot of water diversions. Um, a lot of it was to protect our, our homes on the coast. You know, we didn't want them to flood out when we had a lot of flood, flooding going on. So a lot of these were flood control projects. But while the flood control projects were vital for property owners along the coast, they too wiped out many birds and animals that call the Everglades home. Instead of having a flowing system, 
we've, we've built all these barriers and, and, and segmented the Everglades so into the water conservation areas. So now we have a series of big ponded areas. And so what that's done is it's stopped the flow of water moving through the Everglades. And that has had some pretty severe consequences for the wildlife of the Everglades. The wildlife also came under attack, literally, around the turn of the last century. It was driven by a hot fashion trend, women's hats. There was a buildup going on from the mid-1800s up until the late 1890s um, where there was a more accessibility for the middle class to purchase um, hats and accessories and um, because there was, there was an economic growth happening. So milliners were increasing. Um, by the turn of the century, there were about 83,000 milliners in our country. Milliners make women's hats. A hat reflected a woman's status in society, and a hat adorned with feathers became the ultimate status symbol. Some feathers were much more expensive, so yes. And the more feathers you had, the more status symbol it was. And hence, that's why the middle class was, was doing that. It was making them look like they had more money, which is no different from what's been going on nowadays. <laughs> As the demand for bird feathers increased, so too did the price of feathers. Ornamental feathers fetched $32 an ounce in 1903, or nearly twice their weight in gold. The price of feathers eventually rose to $80 an ounce. There were no laws to protect wildlife, so many hundreds of millions of birds were plundered by so-called plume hunters. Egret feathers were the most highly prized. You were not properly dressed as a woman without feathers emerging from your hat. It got to be so outrageous that egrets were stuffed and actually surrounded a hat, a full egret. For many years, no one questioned the source of the feathers, and there was no mass media or internet to shed light on how those feathers were obtained. But eventually, some women's magazines began writing about them. When the attention started happening towards that, um, and people started picking up and saying, what's going on, are animals being killed, they, the, the general public still didn't know, but the milliners wanted people to think that everything was okay, and they were telling people, oh, we're taking the molten feathers, oh, we're taking the ones that are falling off, and we're taking them from the, the bottom of the rookeries. Well, of course that wasn't really happening because the ones that fell off, the molten feathers, were not so nice. A rookery is a breeding ground for birds, usually high up in a large tree. Some rookeries could hold as many as 500 birds or more. The Everglades are home to the great egret and snowy egret, but the craving for their feathers nearly resulted in their extinction, as well as other species of birds. And I'm not sure we fully grasp today what taking one uh, piece of the food chain out of that chain does to the remainder of it, but it clearly has a domino effect. And what we can say with certainty that over 100 years ago, about 120, 130 years ago, during this period of hunting of bird species, there were so many birds and so many species involved that it disrupted the entire ecosystem from top to bottom. Eventually, people began to take notice, particularly after news reached them about the murder of a Florida game warden who was shot to death by a plume hunter. A group of society women in Boston became particularly outraged by his murder. That group of women grew into the Audubon Society. The Audubon Society movement to, to stop the killing of the birds and to, to slow down the feathers, that started slowing things down. People started realizing, they started getting the word out. Little Audubon Society started you know, popping up all over the country from these society women having their teas and spreading the word, and they were getting their husbands to get involved, and it, and it really started moving. The Audubon Societies put pressure on the New York State Legislature, which passed the Audubon Plumage Bill in 1911. That law made it illegal to sell native bird plumes. It effectively ended the slaughter of native birds. The slaughter of egrets and other plume birds is the central theme of Harvey Oyer's book, The Last Egret. His family has been living in South Florida for five generations after moving here from Chicago in 1872. Back then, 
The family name was Pierce. And my great-great-grandfather was one of the assistant keepers of the Jupiter Lighthouse. And he stayed there for one year. And in 1873, they moved south into what would today be the center of Palm Beach County, uh, in the middle of what we today call the Intercoastal Waterway. Historically, it was called Lake Worth. It was a long freshwater lake, no inlets. And they settled on an island there called Hypoluxo Island. The island was named Hypoluxo by the Seminole Indians because Hypoluxo means water all around, no get out. An appropriate name for an island. We had no doctors, no hospitals, no newspapers, uh, no schools, no churches, no temples, uh, none of the things that we would associate with South Florida today. So it was a very challenging, rugged existence for them. But with all that said, and given all of the challenges uh, and deprivations they experienced, it had to just be a spectacular lifestyle. The woods were teeming with animals, and Lake Worth was clear, fresh water that was fit to drink. Well, when my family first moved here, there, uh, there was no one else here. You, and under the Federal Homestead Act, you could have 160 acres of land for free if you would make it your homestead. But while the land was free, there was no way to actually earn money. So the settlers raised crops and they caught fish and hunted wild animals to feed themselves.